up a lot of myths and misconceptions about growing with LED grow lights and specifically debunking or correcting or just rounding out some of the claims that manufacturers will make. So this video is three different myths or misconceptions that you may be believing and it's just a way to kind of clear the air and analyze the technology from a better perspective. So you can actually say, oh, this is what actually matters when I'm trying to buy an LED grow light and actually grow some delicious food here in this grow tent. So again, we're using the Lead Tonic Z5. Lead Tonic's the sponsor of the video. I'm using this as a good mid-range example from which to compare. So we're gonna use this as our example and then we're gonna go through and talk about all these myths. So before we get into that, we have to define terminology. So let's put our nerd hats on go into the classroom and talk about a couple different acronyms that you have to know before we get into the myths. Our first piece of terminology, PAR, or photosynthetically active radiation. So you can see on the screen right now, we have the electromagnetic spectrum, 400 to 700 nanometers. That is the wavelength range of light that plants tend to use the most of. You can see here's the chart of photosynthetically active radiation. It is actually untrue that the green spectrum is unusable by plants. So this is the question marks there should be resolved. Plants do use light in the green spectrum, but basically what PAR means, it is not a measurement of the amount of light. Rather, it is a measurement or a determination on the quality of that light. Is it within the photosynthetically active range or not, right? Because you don't want to be uh, shining wavelengths of light on a plant that they're not going to be using, right? So then within this, you can start to customize your spectrum and that gets really in depth, which we can talk a little bit more about. But just to get this out of the way, photosynthetically active radiation refers to the range of light that plants are using for photosynthesis. Our second piece of terminology is PPF or photosynthetic photon flux. So what this is, is it's the measurement of the total amount of PAR or photosynthetically active radiation that's being produced by a lighting system every single second. So the measurements are micromoles per second or this right here and what's interesting about ppf is that it's not telling you how much of that light is actually landing upon the plant canopy so you can make some sort of judgment on how effective it is to grow a plant rather what it's telling you is how much is produced by the lighting system itself and so what you can see here in this video is that is basically what we're talking about the photons are coming out of the light and the ppf in micromoles per second is the reading of what's being emitted, not what's being received down here. Our third acronym to know is photosynthetic photon flux density. So basically we're just adding the density dimension to PPF, right? So what this is, is it's the amount of photosynthetically active photons that actually fall on a given surface per second, think of it as raindrops, how many are hitting a given area, right? So what this is, is it's a spot measurement of a specific location on a plant canopy. So it's measured in micromoles per square meter per second, because you need that area dimension to the measurement. That's what gives you our density. Now, here's the tricky part about this, and we're gonna look at a chart in just a second, but you should take average levels here because again, it's a spot treatment or a spot measurement. So that would be the same as if I went out into my garden and I took a soil sample of one area and found that it was deficient in nitrogen, and then I said, my whole garden's deficient in nitrogen. It makes no sense to measure that way. So you have to take a spot measurement around the footprint of the light. And so what we're looking at right here is the the footprint map for the lead tonic z5 and so what you can see this is a three by three total area anything in red was a ppfd measurement taken 12 inches away blue is 18 inches away and black is 24 inches away and so you can see how the numbers change right so one foot in the upper left hand quadrant of the one foot area you can see at 12 inches away the PPFD reading is 731, 18 inches, 457, black, 24 inches, 314. And so the light is hanging right in the middle here, which is why the PPFD readings are the densest in that area. As you move out, even at 12 inches away on these edges here, you have a 43 versus a 731. So you can see 
the fall off is significant and this is classic of any light and and this is why it's misleading to take a manufacturer's PPFD reading, reading that's that's only probably referencing something in the middle here and saying, oh, it's so powerful, it's so strong. They have to provide a chart like this or else, honestly, you probably really shouldn't trust them. So we have one more measurement to go and then we're actually getting into our three myths. Okay, our final piece, which is basically a summation of everything we just learned is photon efficacy, right? And the question then becomes, after we know about photosynthetically active radiation, our PPF and our PPFD, we then have to ask the question, okay, how efficient is a given lighting system, LED or otherwise, at taking electricity it's pulling out of your outlet and converting it into photons of PAR, photosynthetically active radiation, right? So what you can do is you can take PPF, which is calculated in micromoles per second, like we remember, and compare it with the watt measurement of joules per second, and that will give you micromoles per joule, which is a measurement of photon efficacy. Basically, what we're saying is the higher that number, the better that your lighting system is at taking electrical energy and converting it into photons of PAR. And that's gonna lead us right into myth number one, so let's go ahead and get into it. Myth number one is that the power efficiency of your grow light is all that matters. So many growers and even some manufacturers will say, hey, our lights are really power efficient. They don't draw a lot of power, and compared to an HID, it just makes it a better light. Now, we've already kind of debunked that or understood why that's misleading or inaccurate, right? Because that's judging the efficiency of a light simply by how much power it draws, whereas we really want to look at the efficacy of a light. So efficacy is defined as the power to produce an intended effect. So then the question becomes, okay, what is the intended effect of using an LED grow light, or in fact, any grow light. The intended effect is not to maximize for the lowest amount of power drawn out of your electrical outlet. In fact, the intended effect is to most efficiently convert that electricity into photons of PAR, right? Of photosynthetically active radiation. So in that case, what the most efficient, to use the colloquial term, light would be is the light with the highest micromoles per joule, right? The highest amount of conversion of electricity into photons that plants can actually use. So let's take a look at the Leadtonic Z5 for example. It runs at 1.3 micromoles per joule. And at its price range, other lights in a similar price range will run at 0.8 to 1.0 micromoles per joule. Now what that means is that this particular light is 30 to 60%, depending on if it's the 0.8 or the, or the 1.0 reading, more efficient at converting electricity into photons of usable light for plants. Now remember, we just looked at the numerator of that, the micromoles, to make that measurement that we just talked about, but you could look at it from the denominator perspective and kind of flip the script and say, okay, this particular light, the Z5, will draw 25 to 39% less power than similarly priced lights in this range while still putting out the same output of usable light. So that's another way to think of how to compare lights. Now, when it comes to the efficacy of an LED grow light, there are other things you can do to boost the efficacy of a light without really compromising on the practical design. And so you could choose a color of diode that naturally has higher efficacy. So red diodes have the highest efficacy, then it's blue, right? And so you're seeing that trend, right, of those blurple lights, the blue purples, or the blue reds that creates that, that sort of bluey purple vibe. Uh, that's why, because using red and blue diodes have the highest efficacy so you can actually just choose those diode colors and have a relatively high performing light without compromising on other parts so that's something else you could do to boost the efficacy of the light but just to sum it up the the real myth here is that looking at an led grow light and saying it draws a low amount of power compared to some arbitrary light therefore it's better is not the right way to think about it you have to know the micromoles per joule. You have to understand how good it is at taking electricity and turning it into photons of usable light for a plant. For myth and misconception number two, we're talking about the way that LED companies will label their lights. They'll say, okay, this is an 1000 watt grow light and it draws this much power, therefore it's amazing, right? And you'll see this a lot on eBay lights, as I will call them, because there's just a massive market for, let's call them interesting design 
LED lights on eBay. I'm gonna use the Electronic Z5 as a comparison here, and I'm gonna kind of break down and show you what really matters. Kind of like how we dug down into PPF, PPFD, photon efficacy for the output of light in the, in the correct spectrum. We're going to kind of look at how LED lights should be judged versus how they are judged, right? So let's take an eBay light, and let's say it's a an 100 diode light, so there's 100 light emitting diodes on it, and each of those are 10 watts, right? So you're gonna see the manufacturer say, this is a 1000 watt grow light. However, this is not really true, and the reason why is because the higher the wattage of a diode, generally the more heat it's going to output if you were running it at max capacity. If you're throwing 10 watts into each diode, it's going to put out a lot of heat. It's a light emitting diode, but it also emits heat. And you can't get it too high because what's going to happen is the lifespan of the diode is going to decrease and the efficacy is going to decrease. So most manufacturers aren't putting full 10 watts into the diode, although the diode could take it, right? So what they'll say is that this equals 1000 watts. However, the draw power, as in the actual wattage it's pulling from the outlet, might be 180 watts, right? So you're already seeing that it doesn't quite add up, and what you're seeing happen here is, okay, well, 180 watts are being spread across 100 diodes, which means that 1.8 watts of power are going to each diode, which means 1.8, right? Divide that into 10, each diode is running at 18% capacity, which is definitely misleading, right? Because they're gonna say it's in a thousand watt lamp, but you're never running it that, at that level, right? Because it's gonna be putting out too much heat, the, the lifespan will be degraded. And so it's really, really misleading. And this is more of the number that you wanna look at is, okay, of each diode, how much capacity is being used of each diode? And that will give you a hint as to the overall design quality of a light. Let's go ahead and take a look at the stats of the Lead Tonic Z5 to kind of draw a comparison on a per diode basis to really understand the raw nuts and bolts of a light, right? So the Lead Tonic's got 64 total diodes. They're running with three watts, so they're three watt diodes. Now that equals 192 watts, which again, that's misleading, right? So 192 watts is the total potential capacity but it would never run at that level. The draw power is 112 watts. So what you would then do is you divide the 112 into the 192, and what you get is 58, very shoddily drawn, 58%. So on a per diode basis, each diode is being run at 58% capacity. So they're pushing it to right about that sweet spot where you're getting as much light possible out of each diode as you can without going over that threshold of heat and then degrading the lifespan of the light. So what you're seeing here, in comparison to a standard eBay light, if you wanna call it that, you're seeing an almost 3X capacity per diode compared to that, right? And so that can be one more precise way to measure the quality and the build quality, in fact, of a grow light because, you know, let's say that their thermal management and their cooling in this eBay light was a little bit better. Maybe they could push a little more capacity out of their diodes, but over here you've got pretty good thermal management, pretty good cooling practices, maybe better use of fans, better design of the light in general, and they're able to push more capacity per diode. So in that sense, they're getting more efficiency out of the diodes that they're actually putting in. Our final myth or misconception or thing to watch out for is that a manufacturer's PPFD number can be trusted. And it's not necessarily untrue, you can certainly trust, you have to trust them that they're putting something, they're not just straight up lying to you, right? But sometimes they can display it in a misleading way. We already learned from our terminology section that PPFD is a spot measurement. So if you're getting a singular PPFD number from a manufacturer, then that's pretty meaningless, right? Because not only did they not give you the dimensionality of how PPFD falls off 
depending on how far that light is away from the plant canopy, right? So remember earlier we saw 12 inches, 18 inches, 24 inches, but also they need to give you how it falls off as it covers the actual footprint of your growing surface, right? Because in the middle, it's gonna be relatively high, especially if it's close. And then as it falls off towards the edges, then the PPFD numbers fall off as well. So what you need to look for is a chart that gives you an X by X area. Oftentimes it'll be a three by three or a four by four area. And then it gives you multiple readings per quadrant, right? So you saw earlier on that chart, you had a one, two, and three square foot. And within those, you had the each square foot was divided into different quadrants. So it's a very precise measurement. And then you also have to kind of have to look at the, the thing that they're using to measure PPFD in the first place. If they're using some tool that is either not high quality, not accurate, then also you shouldn't be able to trust those either. So it is a lot to take into account, but when you're buying something that is going to be the main factor huh, on whether your plant's going to succeed or not, to me, it makes sense to go deep into some of this and really understand it. So again, I actually am a, quite a fan of the Leadtonic Z5 myself. I've actually been growing with it and, and enjoying it quite a bit. It's in that mid-